My name is Martin Bromley. I'm dad to two young children, Victoria and Adam. And this is the story of the death of my wife, Elaine, who died in March 2005 as a result of an attempted routine operation that went wrong. I'm an airline pilot with a background in human factors. I want to make a difference. I want to be able to say to Victoria and Adam in a few years' time that although their mum died, the lessons from that have been learned and that there is a change in practice in healthcare in the UK. Elaine actually had very good health, but she had suffered from some sinus problems and as a result, uh, a consultant had recommended that she should have routine sinus surgery. We left at 8.30 in the morning having kissed mummy goodbye and went off to do the weekly food shop. I got a phone call at uh, about 11 o'clock that morning from the ENT consultant and they explained to me that when Elaine had been anaesthetised, her airway had collapsed that the oxygen levels in her body had fallen to very low levels. And so they decided that the safer option was to let Elaine wake up naturally. And unfortunately, she hadn't done so. I, I went across to the uh, intensive care unit and there I was met by two further consultants. They explained to me very bluntly that Elaine had been without oxygen for a significant period of time and that I was looking at her having significant brain damage. Another brain scan was taken and uh, even to me as a layman comparing the the new scan with the benchmark scan there was no <coughs> doubt that by this stage there was virtually nothing that could be done uh, for Elaine and uh, I made the decision in consultation with the intensive care team to switch Elaine's life support off. She died some 13 days after the original attempted operation. And really what I want to try and do is just share a bit of the story with you of, of what we know happened. As best we can, we've probably got 80% of the picture now, I think. Uh, Elaine was being cared for by an experienced anaesthetist and his experienced assistant. We'll get on, shall we? The, the plan was that they would start with a laryngeal mask and they had done a very thorough pre-op assessment. There were no undue causes for concern at this stage. And at 8.35 in the morning, Elaine was anaesthetised. Off we go now. Off to sleep. The first mask wouldn't fit. They tried a second mask. Why am I having problems here? I don't know. I'll open this Hold down a bit. Well, let me push the head back a bit more. They then tried some extra drugs to try and reduce some suspected tension in the uh, muscles in the jaw. So it was obvious uh, almost straight away that things were going wrong. We know that two minutes in, Elaine's oxygenation was 75% and falling, and she was by this time already visibly blue. Within four minutes, we know that her oxygenation had fallen to 40% or lower. There's some confusion about the precise time, but we know that six to eight minutes in, a number of things were happening. The anaesthetist had already started to attempt to intubate Elaine. The oxygenation was still at 40% or lower. The heart rate was falling. The ENT surgeon waiting to perform the op came into the theatre. An anaesthetist from an adjoining theatre became aware of a commotion, and he walked in to see what could be done. And at least three nurses answered a call for help. And what happened is that the three consultants continued with the attempts to intubate and they used a variety of different techniques and a variety of different pieces of equipment. The nurses, meanwhile, performed some, uh, some tasks under their own initiative. But what we can say is that 10 minutes in, with hindsight, this is a situation of can't intubate, can't ventilate. This is a recognised emergency in anaesthesia for which guidelines exist. We're now 10 minutes into this attempted procedure. The uh, patient, my wife, is blue. Her oxygenation is 40% or lower, and it has been for six minutes. 
The anaesthetist has 16 years experience and he is regarded as diligent by his colleagues. The ENT surgeon has over 30 years experience. The other anaesthetist has additional skills pertaining to difficult airways. And three of the four nurses are all experienced in their job. And it's perhaps worth just wondering at this stage what was going through their mind. The intubation attempts had failed, the oxygenation was very low. What we know actually happened is this point in, 10 minutes for a further 15 minutes, the three consultants would appear to have continued with their attempts to intubate to the exclusion of any other option. And that at the end of that 15 minutes, we're now 25 minutes into the whole procedure, they eventually get Elaine's oxygenation to 90%, but she's actually been at 40% or lower for a total now for over 20 minutes. Keep going. Can we get above 90? No, nope, she won't go up. No, you got 90 though, that's better. I don't think we should carry on with the operation. No, I agree, I think we should abandon it at this stage. Okay. The airway itself is not secure though, and so they fiddle around a bit more, and in fact her oxygenation falls again below 90% for a further 10 minutes. And finally, by the time we're 35 minutes in, they seem to make the decision that the best thing is just to let her wake up naturally. Let's wheel her back, quick as we can. and they transfer her to the recovery room. She lays there for an hour and a half, and of course, she never wakes up. Based on the evidence from the inquest and from Professor Harmer's report, the lead anaesthetist, if I can call him that, in his own words, lost control. There was a question mark in the inquest about who people felt was in charge at different points. There was certainly a loss of awareness, an awareness of time, but also an awareness of the seriousness of the situation. If you like, the awareness of what was happening wasn't shared by each of the consultants. There was certainly a a breakdown in the decision-making processes and it would appear that the communication processes dried up amongst the consultants. The story with the nurses is very different. The nurses were generally aware of what was happening and what needed to happen. When I said to you that uh, six to eight minutes in those three nurses arrived, one of them asked her colleague to go and fetch the tracheostomy set. There was already a quick tracheo kit in theatre. She went out, she collected the tracheostomy set, she came back in and she announced to the consultants that the tracheostomy set was available and there was no response. One of the other nurses um, who walked in immediately saw Elaine's colour, immediately saw the vital signs and walked out again to phone intensive care. She phoned to check that a bed was immediately available. She came back in and she announced to the three consultants that a bed was available in intensive care. And in her own words, they looked at her as if to say, what's wrong? You're overreacting. She actually walked out and cancelled that bed. At the inquest, two of the four nurses uh, stated that they knew exactly what needed to happen, uh, but again, to quote from the inquest, didn't know how to broach the subject. We have a, a breakdown of leadership, of situational awareness, of prioritisation, of decision making, of communication and of assertiveness. And, and these same factors, these same human factors, ironically, are present in 75% of aviation accidents. Uh, and really, since then, I've been trying to understand why in aviation we, we train and to, to understand about human factors, and it's an integral part of how we design equipment 
and how we manage procedures and how we work day to day. It's part of our everyday language. Uh, but I'm trying to understand why that's not part of clinical practice. 